welcome to our next voyage on T-10, the show with 10-minute takes on the future of education in healthcare. I'm your host, Tim Fitzpatrick. In today's episode, you'll hear from Dr. Lynn Feline, a physician scientist turned CEO and founding director of the Play to Prevent Lab at Yale. Today, she serves as CEO of Playbill, a Yale spin-out company that's harnessing the power of play to enable healthier and better lives for adolescents. Lynn and I first met at the ASU GSV conference last month, and I knew immediately that I needed to learn more about what she's building. Playbill is an outstanding example of what it takes to build a serious games company and is literally writing the playbook for how to do it. With more than 420,000 users, it feels like Playbill team is just getting started after more than 13 years in the making. Lynn opens up about the meticulous data-driven process behind their game development pipeline. But what truly struck a chord with me was Lynn's perspective that knowledge is necessary but not sufficient to have real change. For Lynn and her team at Playbowl, that means reshaping the way adolescents understand and perceive risk, which makes all the difference in areas like smoking cessation and opioid misuse, where Lynn and her team are focused. Without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Lynn Feline, co-founder and CEO at Playbowl. Lynn, welcome to T-10. It's a true pleasure to have you on. Thanks, Tim. It's great to be here. So I want to jump right into what I love about Playbowl, and that is your, your tagline. It's, we harness the power of play to enable healthier and better lives for adolescents. Um, I think, you know, we met a few weeks back. One trend I've noticed in serious games in healthcare is physician scientist leadership. And I think that's a really important trend and something I want to touch on with, with you here. But let's first kind of rewind and talk about how you ended up at Playbill, your background, where Playbill came from. I'd love to just give people an idea of who you are and, and obviously what you do at Playbill. Great. So, um, yeah, so there's, you know, I, I have learned that hearing people's stories is particularly interesting to find out how they got to do what they're doing. And it, it kind of gives a another layer of meaning. So, um, so as you mentioned, I'm a physician scientist. I am a practicing internist. I attend in the hospital, take care of patients, but I also am primarily a researcher and started out um, at Yale about 20 years ago um, in my research career, focusing more on adults and um, developing treatment models to address different issues that adults, especially young adults, were dealing with. And um, as I was doing this work, both the clinical and the research work, I heard more and more from my patients, especially patients who were struggling with things like addiction um, or other, um, other issues, other health issues, that a lot of, you know, a lot of this sort of started during adolescence. And what I heard from them over and over again is if only I knew then what I know now, I might have made different decisions, I might have had more information or skills. And um, so that really hit me. I found that very compelling. I was at the time raising three teenagers in my own home um, with all the obvious struggles and challenges and joys of teenagers and, um, you know, and saw them dealing with some of these issues as well as being very engaged, very captivated by video games. So it seemed like everybody was on a device playing something, you know, totally consumed. And it struck me that if somehow we could couple um, this engagement of, of games and video games with delivering something that is healthy for people, it could be a win-win. And so I pivoted, um, this was 13 years ago, um, and really moved towards uh, thinking about addressing some health issues in a younger population using video games as the delivery vehicle for, for providing that uh, health information and skill building. And at that time, uh, put in a large grant to the NIH, somewhat serendipitously, just said, I'll give it a shot. And um, to their credit, they funded it first time round. And that gave me five years of funding to start my Play to Prevent lab and start doing this work, building our first game, which targeted risk reduction and HIV prevention in uh, younger teens. And so that was the first of our five games uh, that we've been working on with NIH and foundation funding over the past 13 years. Casually, serendipitously, grant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not something you hear very often. So I, I, love, I love that. And so that was, so I understand, 2009, I believe, is mm -hmm. when 
that grant went through when you really started. Uh, that was uh, funding for that first game you mentioned. You've now developed five games, I know, in around 2015, play to prevent at Yale. But could you talk us through, uh, you mentioned several areas. So kids ages 10 to 20, I think it is. But what are those areas mm-hmm. that you've really focused in on through your lab and, and now obviously with Playbill? Yeah, so they they range from, so the age range, as you mentioned, was 10 to 20. So each game has sort of their dedicated uh, age range that is is being targeted. And um, anything from, as I mentioned, our first game was focusing sort of generally on risk reduction, HIV prevention in a younger group of teens. Uh, we have a game smoke screen that focuses on smoking and vaping prevention in sort of a middle, early high school age group, one that focuses more on health promotion, um, helping kids become their own sort of agents in their in their own health care. And the most recent game, which was actually built, uh, funded as part of the large uh, NIH HEAL initiative, HEAL stands for Helping to End Addiction Long Term. It's a, we're one of uh, 10 prevention sites around the country. And this game, which is called Play Smart, focuses on mental health promotion and prevention of opioid misuse in older teens, high schoolers. Uh, so we have this portfolio of games that, quite frankly, have in some ways followed the the trends in in health and healthcare. And so vaping became a huge epidemic, still unfortunately is. It launched our work in smokescreen, and then obviously mental health and substance misuse, particularly opioid misuse, is another dual epidemic currently going on, especially with young people. And so this was our opportunity to build something that would address those two issues. One one thing that really resonates with me that I've heard you speak about before is how you run your team. Obviously, I think it's, it's uh, fascinating and interesting that you are in a leadership role that you have so much experience in, in the clinical domain, but now you're also working with game developers in this serious game space and I think one thing that in particular that I think is exciting is that you realized that the game playbook was kind of the way you were going to align those two teams, being the uh, kind of how are we deploying this and implementing this, but also how are we building this? And the lesson there, I think, is is something I'd love to have you speak to of, of why that's so important, especially now you mentioned healthcare ties. And um, I do want to get to how you think about deploying with education settings, but For all the people out there who are excited about serious games, who are thinking about developing for a specific area, maybe something you did mention or did not mention, how how can they learn from what you've you've now learned in building this playbook and the other ways that you've designed instruments for keeping people aligned and on the same page? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question and was a very steep learning curve, one that I think I think we had to go through. You know, we are, um, Play to Prevent is an academic research lab, and we were fortunate enough to, to partner very early on with Shell Games, who is an incredibly talented, um, incredibly productive, incredibly collaborative team that we've worked with now on all five of these games. And, but as you bring together two different groups who, you know, both have their sets of skills and their expertise, and you try to combine them for a shared goal, what we learned early on was that we needed a way to communicate. We needed a way to all be literally on the same page in terms of how we were building these games, what had to go into that process. Um, And so we actually ended up developing a game playbook for each of these games that was a living, breathing document that we shared with Shell Games throughout the development process. Everyone contributed to it and included um, things such as sort of what theoretical constructs we were using to build the game, um, kind of in the background, what game mechanics, what what we call player transformation goals we were looking to accomplish, what we hope to change in the player through this game. And so this ended up becoming our sort of manual, our, you know, our product manual in a sense in terms of what all the components you know were going that were going into the game how they fit together and that both teams were completely aligned and that was an incredibly important process and system that we developed because we carried that throughout each game um, each game development um, process and was integral i think for us for us landing where we needed to land with these games Um, so that 
that was not, that was a learned lesson. That was not one we walked into this process with and, but incredibly valuable. And I think the games reflect that kind of cohesiveness between the, the, the two teams. I think it's it's such an important point, and it's uh, it's earned wisdom. I think that to your point, this is something that mm-hmm. um, I, not being in this space, but working with multidisciplinary teams and trying to build content, but then content that has has an application and has an outcome you want to measure. And I want to I want to get to that too. But to be able to have something that is collaborative by nature, that is a living, breathing document, just the value of that can't be overstated. So I, I love that point and. I think your anecdote on mm-hmm. the labyrinth game, I think it was, that was uh, one of the, the lessons that brought it. And what, what is, I'm curious if that's, if that was the game, if that was the moment this kind of sparked the, the realization. I, yes, that was sort of the, you know, so so with our first game, and, and this is actually a mini game that's been carried through in different forms and other games that we've we've created. Um, one mini game that we had with that that first game was um, a refusal mini game where basically the player is, you know, needs to learn how, you know, in a in a cognitive way, learn how to, um, you know, respond to offers that may be risky, people who may be risky, figure out how to negotiate and navigate without losing, you know, losing losing their place with their friends or you know with their social circle. And so this this was very much you know using a set of evidence-based steps of how to go through refusing. And before we had created our game playbook strategy, um, what was presented back to us by the game developers, which was a a beautiful um, sort of rendering of, this was again on the iPad, just as the iPad was first being released. Um, And the iPad, you know, senses movement. And so what they had brought back as sort of a sample of this mini game was, an iPad version of the Labyrinth game, which if folks remember the Labyrinth game, you think of a big wooden box and you basically kind of tilt it back and forth to keep the marble from falling in, you know, kind of traveling through without falling into the holes. Very, very metaphorically representing, you know, if you can maneuver yourself, you can, you know, avoid falling into, you know, the holes, which are seen as the risky, dangerous things. Um, Of course, that didn't really translate to what we were trying to do cognitively, which was helping kids develop these skills and, you know, information on how to actually interact with others and and negotiate and navigate through those risky situations. So we had to pause and we had to say beautiful game, beautiful representation, but this isn't going to accomplish what we need to. It's a great hand-eye coordination game, but it's, you know, it's, it's not going to translate. And so that was one of the major things that prompted us to think about this shared um, document that would kind of keep us all on the same page in terms of what we, what we needed to accomplish. Amazing. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that anecdote. I, I want to shift and talk about uh, opportunities for, for Playable. So my, I want to make sure I understand the where it is today. So it's highly accessible. These are web-based games, the five games you've described. I think I've seen 250,000 players, but that might be a little stale. It's in the hundreds of thousands mm-hmm. of players. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm curious if we could talk about where where Playbill is used. So you're deploying this, ideally, um, healthcare settings, education settings, kind of talk to us about who is using it today and ideally who some of those stakeholders and partners are that you see for, for Playbill. Sure. And I mean, to to sort of back up just a a minute, um, also to say, I mean, sort of what, you know, where did Playbill come from? And I think that it's important to, you know, the lab has been very productive in development evaluation. Again, we, you know, we evaluate each of our games typically with a randomized control trial and rolling, you know, hundreds of kids following them for a year, in some cases, two years. Um, And that's really the work of the lab is that's what we do as scientists. Um, With the, you know, the beginning of the pandemic, there was a huge uptick in the requests for our games. I mean, and it was totally made sense by November of 2020, teachers, parents, kids, everyone was really in dire need of content for kids who were home and weren't in school anymore. So, 
the increase in demand really pushed me to think about spinning out Playable, which is what I did in early 2021 from the lab with the very specific goal of Playable focusing on the marketing and distribution of these games. As you mentioned, we have given out, I think now close to 420,000 logins for our games. Um, and what we just, the lab just couldn't keep up with this constant demand, which is literally, you know, daily handfuls and handfuls of daily requests. Um, so that sort of set the stage for our, our primary focus being educational settings. Most, the vast majority of our requests come from educators or from students, in some cases, parents. Um, and so we have really kind of started Playable with a focus in educational settings, responding to that that demand and uh, now are moving into, you know, more clinical settings. Um, I actually had a conversation with a, an adolescent medicine physician, um, a very large children's hospital in the Midwest who reached out because she wanted to use our games um, with her patients in her waiting room. She said they have major issues around vaping in their patients. And in that sense, in the waiting room, these are folks who are captive audience. You know, they're sitting there for 30, 35 minutes and the notion of offering them something that is healthy for them and something that is delivering health content in a way that they are going to be happy about and engaged in seems like a real win-win. So she and I are, are working out how exactly that will work, but I see that as another really important area besides educational settings is health systems, you know, outpatient clinics where, you know, I know I had two kids who spend a lot of time in orthodontist's office and our orthodontist actually had video games in their waiting room, you know, like regular old video games. And they used to love to go to the orthodontist. So, you know, finding kids where they are and want to be is, is really the ticket, I think. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm so glad we, we came back to that. And I think I uh, saw in your RCTs, I, I would love to have you talk a bit more about the outcome side because that'll get us into the engagement behavior change. But the time periods you look at, I think are, are really interesting and, and unique, uh, obviously, to the, the level of evidence that you're generating at, at the lab and then what that is, uh, what that happens with, with Playbill and what you're able to offer. So could you talk more a bit about those um, hundreds of kids who are in taking part in that RCT, which is that by itself at the tail end of a probably what 12 to 18 month development period for your game. So I'd love to hear more about that process. Yeah. So that's, I and mean, that's a really important part of this, the development process typically, I mean, our games range in size. Our largest game is about 16 hours of unique gameplay. Um, but, you know, development can take anywhere between six to 18 months. But then we have to actually, you know, be able to demonstrate that it does something. And if we're going to do good science, we really need to do that, you know, using the most rigorous methods. And so we design our, you know, efficacy trials in the way that we would design any other efficacy trial. The difference is the delivery vehicle is a video game. So, um, so for example, our current study is enrolling 532 kids ages 16 to 19 at 10 schools around Connecticut. We will follow them for 12 months and they are assigned essentially either to play, you know, our play smart game, which again, focuses on mental health and, and opioid misuse, um, or a set of control games. And then we collect data from all of them at baseline, uh, six weeks at the end of gameplay, three months, six months, and 12 months. And this allows us to really say that we've accomplished something and we've accomplished what we set out to accomplish. Um, you know, it's, it's really important that the kids like our games, that they engage, and we've been able to demonstrate that they do play for hours and hours um, without us tying them to a chair or <laughs> forcing them to do that. They, they get very engaged and very pulled in. Um, but we've also been able to demonstrate over, you know, a period of a year and, you know, and, and with our first game, two years that we see statistically significant differences in a range of outcomes, um, you know, be it, I mean, low level is knowledge. Knowledge is, you know, necessary, but not sufficient for what we need to prove, but attitudes, beliefs, risk perceptions, um, uh, 
added what I said attitudes and tensions. So especially if we're looking to promote certain types of behaviors um, to increase their intentions, their sense of self-efficacy, um, all of those are tied directly to their actual behaviors. Um, one of the challenges with prevention work and prevention research is sometimes to see the actual impact on outcomes, especially in a young age group, can take you know many, many years. Um, but if we can demonstrate that we've really shifted their sense of you know perceptions, beliefs, attitudes, intentions, um, confidence, uh, those are really good signs that we've we've made a change in how they're going, the decisions they're going to make and, and the behaviors they're going to engage in. So we've published over 25 papers, both on our process, um, some of which we've discussed and then the outcomes as well. And to me, that's critical. Uh, we have to be able to say what exactly we've accomplished. Yeah, this uh, this whole notion, I'm, I'm so glad you went into this. Thank you. I love the idea that we see it often around patient activation is a theme we see in the clinical side, right? Knowledge, skills, and confidence for patients. And how do you help on that on that front? I see so much overlap in how you think about these problems and measuring those problems. You mentioned these papers. I'd love to talk about, um, I know in the past we talked about kind of what's next, what you get excited about. And when we talk about outcomes, I have to imagine there's a lot of data that you're excited about, thinking about um, that are generated from usage of these games is that something that's top of mind? I'd love to have you talk about, have you published on that? I thought I heard somewhere you had started to think about this or you think about it for years, but um, could you speak to some of that gaming insights that I think is so valuable and unique to what it is that you're building in the space you're building in? Yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's what, you know, what we're calling um, in-game data. So, so the data that is produced by uh, each game software and sort of then fed out through its backend system. And this data is, you know, I think this is just a whole new world um, in terms of, you know, how it might be used, what it may tell us, what it may tell us about um, not only engagement, but, you know, how we might be able to really connect uh, in-game player behavior with their real world behavior. So, you know, especially in science, we rely a lot in, in clinical research, we rely on self-report. If the notion that what somebody does in a game might tell us something about who they are, what decisions they may make, what risks they might take, um, what they may be at risk for, that to me is just incredibly exciting. I don't, you know, I think it's, it's, there's a lot of exploration to be done. This is certainly not, you know, this, it's, we have not finalized this work in any way, but um, we did pay, publish a paper early on, sort of looking at that in-game data from one from our first game and comparing it to what is sort of you know considered the gold standard, which is standardized assessment data, and could find very strong correlations between kids who did really well in the game, their performance of the game, and their their gains um, on the different assessments through the standardized assessments. So we're sort of slowly chipping away at this. Um, there's a investigator in my lab who has been very interested in continuing in that work and really looking at what this in-game data may tell us. Um, through Playable, we've been able to, with um, some funding through Yale, been able to um, build a data dashboard that essentially feeds that in-game data through the backend system directly to this dashboard, which would interface with an educator or a clinician, um, and provides very rich engagement data about the player, either individually or an in aggregate, if you've had a number of players um, play the game. And this is anything from how long they played in total, how long they played in each part of the game, which parts of the game they replayed, the calculation of the stickiness factor in terms of how often they came back and played. So I think this data, is, this is a very long-winded way to say that, I think this is really valuable, rich data. You know, it's just, it's just figuring out, you know, because there's so much of it, really mining it and figuring out what you know, how to best apply it in a way that can be tested and validated. Um, and so that's sort of the process that we're, we're going through right now. And, and 
from a playable standpoint, what we've heard from many you know, potential customers and customers is that the value of having that type of engagement data is huge for them to be able to say, yes, I, you know, I know my eighth grade class all played this game, but now I actually have an objective report that tells us all about what their experience playing the game was and that they actually did play. Like we don't have to sit there and watch them. We actually can generate their actual, you know, information from the end game data. So I think the, I think the opportunities are mere, I mean, there are so many of them that, that, um, so we're just trying to dig into that and really start, you know, building models and thinking about how this data can be used. Yeah. And I think, so that's fascinating. I think in addition to being able to finally understand engagement data, I think also giving those educators, whoever the stakeholder is, the tools to objectively measure things they couldn't otherwise measure in real life, I think is fascinating, right? These, the whole idea of in-game in behavior versus real world behavior and actually having a chance because it's a game, because of this medium to measure things you just can't otherwise do or in situations that you can replicate uh, many right. times over on demand in the game, for example. I think that's, that's really cool. Um, can we talk a bit about barriers, challenges? I mean, now you're you're obviously you've been a scientist and, and been studying these and now you're commercializing, you're thinking about how do we get these into the market? And uh, I'm just curious, high level people you're talking to, it sounds like there's demand. Obviously we know uh, macro demand and all the reasons why people are asking and, and coming to the site and asking for logins. Do you see barriers in the short term or any specific areas where people may either not be comfortable with the technology or not see the potential? And where, where are you seeing kind of challenges, obstacles for you getting playable out to, to more and more users? Yeah, interesting. It, it, you know, from what I've heard from teachers and parents and kids, it's, it's sort of expected. They are not particularly wary of video games. I mean, they really see that this makes a lot of sense that, you know, that to be able, again, be able to deliver content that can be positive and, and healthy for kids, they they totally get that. Um, and, you know, but I think, you know, part of the infrastructure that is lacking is is funding for these, especially in educational settings. I think that there is, I, I just sort of assume that if you create high quality evidence-based, you know, digital games that you would just sort of drop them into the pipeline and they would just go off and land in every <laughs> school in the country. I mean, that I wasn't that grandiose, but it just seemed like there would be channels that would exist and that it would be much more streamlined. And what I found is that there is so much demand. There is so much interest. There's, um, but, you know, depending on the educational settings, there are issues with funding. Um, you know, I work with teachers, you know, in the greater New Haven community that sometimes have to pay for pens and pencils themselves. So this is not a new problem. It's a really distressing and, and, and you know, um, egregious problem that the, the funding isn't there. But I think, I think figuring out how, you know, to fund these types of tools, which are really very much health curriculum and, and schools and other youth related organizations are really lacking in, in health education. I think that's a major challenge as well. And one of the things that I've heard over and over again from educators, from health education educators, is that these games provide them with the content they need to give to their students, to their kids, um, without requiring a lot of their time, the educator's time, without requiring a lot of space, because you don't need space, manpower. So, so there's huge advantages, both logistical as well as economical, to be able to use games like this. But funding is not, there's no standardized funding for health education in this country. Um, there was some ridiculous statistic I remember reading when I wrote my most recent grant was, and it was the disconnect between that actually seven states would require it, but not require it be accurate. Again, there's just, there's no, 
you know, it feels like there's just not the standardization and the support for health education um, in schools. And in clinical settings, somewhat similarly, I mean, the time is certainly very limited. Um, and are there options for providers to get reimbursement from payers for using tools like this? Um, they're sort of health provider extenders, if you will, because they allow the distribution and dissemination and sharing of, of this content without requiring it come from a clinician. So is that something that would be of value to payers? So those are some of the challenges. Those are big nuts to crack. Those they are. I'm I'm so happy to hear you're you're thinking about them. I love the flexibility you have, kind of uh, your the relevance and the applicability across uh, multiple very large needs that pressing needs that address you know, tens of millions of potential people who need this, from adolescents to clinical settings. Uh, just just fascinating. I'm excited to dive into the final frontier, Lynn, with you. If you're ready for the final. <laughs> Five questions in, in 50 seconds this is how we wrap up. I think we've already touched on quite a few of these uh, just as part of the conversation flow, but let's let's dive in with uh, the top challenge you see in your space. Probably the one I just mentioned. I, th I think creating systems and, and I, I see it happening. Um, I've been working intensively with the CDC on having them sort of work on a national level around um, promoting these games and providing um, the settings for these games. But I think, I think having, you know, more of a system, more of a standardization of health education, um, whether it's digital health or not, is really a challenge that needs to be solved. Awesome. How about top opportunity? I think what I've learned with time is certainly from the you know the standpoint of serious games is that they have a huge role and huge opportunity in um, in you know providing health education providing skills that lead to better outcomes uh, for kids uh, as well as for adults around health and well-being um, and now with the addition of exploring the in-game data I think also may be very powerful assessment tools so you may be able to couple an intervention, uh, with an assessment and actually even personalize it based on that assessment to make that intervention even more impactful. Amazing. Love it. Uh, tech trend, top tech trend you're following. Uh, I don't know. I think I got enough tech trends in, in my, in my I think, I think you do. Yeah. lab and my company. So I, I was lucky to get on Chrome, but uh, so, yeah, I think, I, you know, I, I think there's, it's obviously, you know, the, it's, it's a, a brand new world in terms of all of this stuff that I just started using chat GPT and it's just mm -hmm. sort of floors me. So I, I find it entertaining. I also find it scary, but I think there are also huge opportunities. Again, tech is only as good as those who are using it. So I think it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's exciting, but I'm with you. you need to be cautious. So. Absolutely. All right. Final two wrapping up here. Any media recommendations you suggest books, podcasts, articles, um, anything along those lines that you're listening to these days? Um, you know, uh, I just actually, there was a great, article in the New York Times this weekend, actually by a friend, Emma Goldberg, who writes for the business section. And on a book that was published um, and then republished in 2021 called The Defining Decade, which is basically um, geared towards folks in their 20s and helping them figure out kind of how they should be living their lives, uh, especially around their careers. So I have started reading that and I have dug into it and I think I'm obviously quite a bit past my 20s um but I do have kids in my in their 20s and I think it's you know I think it's really interesting to just be very thoughtful about what you want to do with your life you know and this this book has highlighted that for me and sort of you know I, I think you know to make choices and and think about big picture about really what makes you happy um and best you can do that thing so that's that's my top recommendation right now is the defining decade. 
I love that. We'll make sure we link to it in the show notes. People can read it. And then last, last one is uh, leaders you're following. This can be anything from technology to research leaders in your field, just people that we'd want to be aware of who, uh, who you're learning from. Yeah. I mean, I think this is, you know, this is maybe sort of old fashioned, but Vivek Murthy is somebody who I really respect, you know, the uh, U.S. Surgeon General Vivek was um, remarkably a med student here about six years after I was. So he's, he's, He's uh, somebody I really respect, although I also feel like, oh, my God, he must have been one of my students when I was a resident. Um, I just think, you know, I think he is it's a it's a tough job. I think his focus on youth mental health is absolutely critical. And I think facing it head on is is, you know, really important. You can't you can't wish it away. So um, he is somebody that I. I follow and really respect and think he is, he's really taken on some of the, the biggest issues in healthcare and health. So. Amazing. Well, thank you for weathering the final frontier. Lynn. it was such a pleasure <laughs> having you on before we go, where, where can people get a hold of you? How can they get a hold of you to, to learn more about you and Playbill after this is over? Yeah. So um, Playbill has a great website, which I'm sure you can drop in um, drop in as well um as well as the lab and you know if anyone is interested feel free to reach out to me um their my email address is associated with both and um yeah i mean obviously i i i love the work we do i feel like it's incredibly valuable it, it has huge public health implications and so i'm really proud of it and always happy to talk about it Amazing. Well, Lynn, it's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you for, for joining us and sharing on T-10. Thank you, Tim. This was great. Appreciate it. Uh -huh.